So I was hoping that I captured this. Um, I noticed that I was getting uh, a shallower cut as I would route, and sure enough, that router was slipping. Uh, so the way I approach edge routing of circles, regardless of the diameter of the circle, is number one, I am fully aware that the very first time I plunge into that bit, that bit is spinning and the bit is gonna to wanna to push my stock that direction. So I don't just go straight into the bit, I always go into the bit while rotating, beginning my travel and I get over to the ball bearing as quickly as possible. At any point when you're routing against a ball bearing guided router bit, at any point you like, you can pull away from the bit. So if something doesn't feel right, maybe you feel like you're cutting too deep, which I did on my very first pass on one of these discs, you just pull away. Um, at that point, I could adjust the, the bit down and make more passes, which would work out just fine. Now, the next thing that you saw me do is I routed a section of that circle. I didn't try to hold the circle down and go around and around and around. You could do that. I don't do that. Um, I like to route a section of it and then pull away. So I'm actually roll, pushing the disc past the cutter. Again, I could stay in one place and kind of rotate the disc. I just have never been comfortable doing that. It's not the way I do it. Uh, again, so I, I'm routing along and then I decide, okay, I'm at the point where I want to stop. I, I visually look at a spot on the grain when I pull away because I'm going to want to make sure if I've routed to here, that when I come back into the bit, that I begin on a section of this where I've already routed. That way I'm not having to repeatedly plunge into that solid piece of stock. So again, I go maybe around a quarter, stop, reposition myself, overlapping where I've already routed, do a little bit more. With a circle, you can go around again. It, well, really anything. You can, go, you can route again and again and again. If you're doing an edge profile, as long as you're not raising this side up, causing the, the wood to go in too deep, um, you're not going to cut deeper than the bit and the bearing and the table will allow. It's assuming that you're holding the board down flat to the table. If the, if the board is sagging off, then you can come back and take another pass. Um, with a bit like that, that's pretty big. It's pretty aggressive. That is the... Um, a cutter that's typically used under the lip of a table. And I use this on the shaker candle stands that I like to make. I like to make the tops out of three quarter inch material, but then that looks too heavy. So by using a cutter like that, it makes it appear to be, look at it from that angle where you don't see the bottom, it makes it appear to be thinner stock than it actually is. So if you're like me, you're quite comfortable using a three-eighths or quarter-inch roundover. It's you know not that aggressive. But on these pieces, I'm cutting with a cutter that reaches out an inch. So it's got a big old honking cutter on it. So I'm doing this in a couple passes for one thing, just to be comfortable. Now, another thing that's making me a little uncomfortable is the fact that I am missing my table insert for this router table. So that means for these cuts, uh, a fair amount of this stock is hanging over that opening. <clears throat> With these big pieces, I still have plenty to support, but we're about to move on to a smaller piece. And this is a prototype size. And you can see how much smaller that is than our old, old stock. And <clears throat> that's reaching way too far out over that opening. I have here what is essentially masonite, a tempered hardboard that has this uh, white smooth surface on it. They sell these at lumber yards and home centers. Some folks will put these as like bathtub surrounds. Um, I've also used these for years as whiteboards in my shop, very inexpensive. So I have scrap of this laying around. And as you can see, I've cut an opening large enough for my bit. 
And I'm just going to apply this with double-sided tape to the table. And uh, that'll give me support uh, a little bit closer to my bit, which will make me a bit more comfortable, no pun intended. You may also be curious about this red tape. Um, we knew that we were having a dust collection issue here because we're just running a shop vac. So uh, we cut some cardboard, wrapped it around my router table base, and just taped it in place for now. And the only hose we have for the shop vac is running here on the, uh, on the fence. So we're gonna take this, this material and apply a few pieces of double-sided tape to this. And uh, that's gonna be all it will take to hold this in place. I, I use the technique that uh, Paul Akers, the inventor of this product uses, and that is I'll, I'll take the tip of my knife and coming in from the edge, I'll just stick the tip into the backing and, and pull it away from the edge. And that usually will, will get it <laughs> to start, but of course it's, uh, it's not wanting to do that. There we go. That's so much easier than trying to pick away at the corner And then we'll just eyeball that into position. Make sure our bit's gonna clear. And we should be good to go. All right, so another thing that I have to contend with today is the fact that as I was wrapping up yesterday, I was starting to get some burning from the bit. That's for a couple reasons. The first one is I am not using a variable speed router, therefore I am not able to, to slow it down. The uh, no load speed on this router is 23,000 RPM. Thomas would point out that's not the speed that it's actually spinning when it's touching wood. You are correct, but it's pretty fast. And um, so you know, it, it's, it's getting warm and any bit's going to get warm because it is, uh, there's friction being built up as it's cutting. What that causes is it, number one can cause the bit to dull but I find that it also causes buildup to begin to build up on the bit. This could be from sap or resin or whatever happens to be naturally occurring in the wood. And as I wrapped up last night, I was noticing I was getting some burning. And so I wanna clean this bit off. And um, I, I don't have, typically I like to use a, a blade cleaner. You can buy a, an aerosol blade cleaner. You can use it on, on all your bits. Before that was a commercially available thing, we used to use um, uh, oven cleaner, and that that's fine. It seems to be kind of caustic. You wanna be sure you wear gloves, and I would say the same is true of the blade cleaners. Um, but what I do have and has, uh, has worked okay is a product, is a product called Never Dull. Um, I use this for polishing metal, and um, it, it'll clean these off without a lot of effort, as long as you get to them while you're using them before you get a lot of buildup. So I have turned the router off, I have unplugged it from the wall, and let's clean this bit up real quick. It's like watching paint dry, isn't it? <laughs> I think we're in pretty good shape now. That one's a little cleaner than that one. All the way to that corner. Of course, that's the one spot that's doing all the work. All right, there we go. Look at that. Look at that bit drop. So I was hoping that I captured this. Um, I noticed that I was getting uh, a shallower cut as I would route and sure enough that router was slipping. Um, I wound up taking it out, cleaning the body off with some scotch bright. I bought some anti-seize. I applied that to the body uh, just not to lubricate it because I certainly don't want it becoming loose but to keep it from galling. Galling is where you get um, two 
metals that will kind of begin to stick and bond to each other that happens under vibration as it does here with this router. And uh, as a result, I would get what felt like a secure fit. Um, and yet, obviously it wasn't working quite right. 